on just a minute. We're having a few technical difficulties. Thank you. Okay, we're ready. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. On the, the 17th of March, uh, 2023, happy St. Patrick's Day to everyone. I would like to call the Operations Committee meeting of the Bi-State uh, Board to order. Uh, Myra, will you call the roll, please? Commissioner Wynn Miller. Present. Commissioner Cox. Commissioner Galladay. Here. Commissioner Brown. Here. Commissioner Beach. Here. Commissioner Simmons. Commissioner Pastello. Commissioner Johnson. Here. Commissioner Moore. Present. Commissioner Gladney. Present. And you may proceed. Thanks very much. Myra, I know there was some public comment. Um, we report on those comments and we know that we, we also have them um, both on the website and on in our board books. Yes, we received two public comments. Both were from Mr. Shannon Vila. The topics included a request for more details and specific regarding staffing and route performance and reports on missed trips by route each day. So we will pass those comments on to staff um, for review and, and for follow-up. So thanks very much. Um, the first order of business is approval of the minutes of the January 27th, 2023 Operations Committee open meeting. Are there any changes to the minutes? Hearing none, may have a motion to approve. More moves. Second. Second. Thank you. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Next item is the contract award for the DeBolivar Powerhouse Rehabilitation. And I believe Tom Curran is going to provide comments. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Uh, as, as noted, the first proposal for your consideration is a request to allow the president and CEO to enter into a contract with Ranieri Construction LLC for rehabilitation of the DeBolivar Powerhouse. The Powerhouse is located at the corner of DeBolivar Avenue and Delmar Boulevard. And by say it has owned the structure since 1963. It was built in 1902 for the purpose of supplying power to the world's fair streetcars in Forest Park. An agreement is in place with the Missouri State Historic Preservation Office to rehabilitate this building which is eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. Last December, by state issued a request for proposals for the powerhouse renovation, and 32 firms and six construction clearinghouses were notified of the opportunity. Only one proposal was received in response to the solicitation, and that proposal is from Ranieri Construction. The contracting officer surveyed other firms who chose not to bid, and of the few responses received, firms indicated that they were too busy to consider this project. An updated briefing paper, including the specific contract amount, will be provided prior to the Board of Commissioners meeting on April 21st, following contract negotiations. Management is recommending that the Operations Committee approve a contract with Ranieri Construction LLC for rehabilitation of the Devolver Powerhouse using federal and Proposition M funds. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Have we, uh, Madam Chairman, may I ask a question? Sure. Um, Tom, have we dealt with them in the past? I recall reading about them uh, extensively in the past in various trade yes. journals, including the Labor Tribune. We have dealt with Renary Construction a number of times on various projects. That's correct. And, and uh, no problems? Uh, there was a contract within the last year uh, where they were unable to perform the contract to our satisfaction, and there was a mutual decision to drop that project and rebid it, I believe. Uh, the other ones, the other contractors that did not 
it said they were too busy. It, it was the supply chain or uh, issues you think also, or just? Uh, most, of, most of what we're hearing is that there are not enough staff to perform on these projects. So it's beyond the supply chain. It's actually having a pain power. And also because there's a lot of demand in the market, but with a weak labor force. Hmm. And uh, they, they're required to follow Davis Bacon Act uh, and uh, prevailing wage, correct? Given the source yes, of funding. They right, they would for any construction project using federal funds, that's correct. Okay. But Tom, you're still in contract negotiations, but do we have, um, and I apologize, I haven't had a chance to look at everything in the board, um, in the operations committee book this, um, this week. Do we have a timeline? The timeline for the, the construction of the project itself? Yeah. Or for that, okay. I, I don't think that there is. Essentially, uh, we have to uh, work on the roof, which is a slate roof, uh, the wooden windows. Uh, there is masonry work to be done. Uh, the building sits on the corner. Uh, I don't know if you could remember seeing this before, but it actually forms the corner of our property for the Devolver bus uh, facility. So on either side of the building is the fence and the brick, uh, the brick fence, and then the the top of the fence on uh, the Del Delmar side. Excuse me, the Devolver side. Uh, and so it's really part of our property. That's the challenge. Uh, and because it's historic, we need to deal with it. And again, there's an agreement in place to preserve it. Uh, it doesn't have enough parking for us to break this off as a parcel uh, and adapt it for private use. So. Uh, again, we're just trying to deal with the situation that we're in. So, so since it's an historic uh, structure in an historic district, does it require uh, approval from the city's preservation board? Yes, there's an agreement in place, I believe, already for that. Okay. Chris, Baylor, Chris Baylor is the expert on this project, but he, he is out of town, so I apologize for my lack of, of details on this project. That's okay. I'm not surprised, given that it's an historic um, building, that we're having trouble finding anyone to work on it. So I, I hope that we'll be able to come to some kind of a contractual arrangement and that the work gets done. Any other questions? Yeah, I've got one. Sorry. I, I know this isn't exactly my committee either, but I just wanted to, is, is it normal to have contracts approved like this in the operations committee before they without it without them being finalized and having a number behind them especially in an instance where you only have a, a single bidder is that is that something that needs to happen or, or you know what what's the timeline like for getting this fixed like could it potentially be rebid any of that sort of stuff because it seems like there are some good questions being raised by rose and terry and and probably others um and this seems like a pretty complicated deal and i this wasn't yours so if, if you know if you have to get back to us or something that's fine too but that's just trying to put it all together sure so there have been interested in instances where you have pre-approved projects uh pending the award of the highest bidder or the decision on the pricing uh but not just at the committee level not at a board level so that by the time the board makes a decision uh everything has to be set so the board would never make a decision uh, based on information that's still forthcoming. But there have been instances like this in committee where that's happened. Uh, and if the, if the committee is not comfortable with making this decision, uh, I can't imagine that the time frame is such that it needs to start immediately. So it, it, could, it could wait, I believe. And again, I'm sorry that, that Chris isn't here to share any more information. Rose, Rose can I make a suggestion here? Sure, Tommy. Um, so what we could do, so in an instance where we have a single bidder, we are allowed to go into essentially a ne negotiated contract. Um, and that's the situation we have here and why some of these areas are not specific, specifically spelled out. Uh, and that is, and that is for Chris to handle. What I would suggest maybe is that we not put it in a consent agenda for this committee and pull the contract out uh, so that it can be a specific line, line item at the full board so that then we can forward those negotiated contracts to all of the board members so these so more detail can be pulled out and appropriately answered. That would be my suggestion. 
I'm, I'm fine with that. If, if, I, I think Commissioner Moore had a question as well. So let's continue the conversation and then we can make a decision about that. Actually, uh, Chairman Wynn Miller, you touched on my question. So it has been answered. Okay. So the other thing I just wanted to add um, to Sam's inquiry is that as long as I've been on the board um, in terms of the operations committee, Everything that needs to for obviously for to go before the board for full approval comes to a committee first. And so it might be approved at a committee level, but it's always then re reviewed again at the board level. Um, but in this instance, I think it would be important to pull this one out, particularly because it's a single, there's only a single bidder, and because of the historic preservation issues involved. So if we can pull that out of the consent agenda, Taldian. Um, separate that out, that would be great. We'll do, and we'll go ahead and, and detail and review these questions. And I'll have uh, Chris specifically kind of pull some of those out within the negotiations so that we can be as clear as possible. So to be clear on, on item number five, the contract award, do we need to take a vote on it? Or are we just tabling it? And do we need a vote for that? I may, uh, Commissioner Wynn Miller, we could, you could take a vote to approve it subject to uh, it being separately stated on the uh, board agenda for the, for the April meeting so that there can be a further scrutiny and review before the board actually approves the contract. Okay, so we're making an amended motion, correct? Yes. Great. Any other questions? You have a the amended emotion motion then and, and I'm sorry, Barb, could you state that please again so we all know exactly what it is? The motion will be to approve um, the contract for 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 furthering to the to the board, but that it not be put on the consent agenda, but will be separately indicated on the agenda for the board. Is there a motion for that? So moved. Second. Thank you. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you very much. Next item is a construct is a contract award for the construction of the charging infrastructure for the battery for electric buses. And again, uh, Tom Curran has some some comments for us. Thank you, Commissioner. Metro is in the process of procuring battery electric buses to replace some of its diesel buses currently operating from the Devolver bus facility. And plans call for a fleet of 12 40 foot battery electric buses with gradual implementation of this fleet starting in late 2024 or early 2025. In order to enable the operation of a battery electric fleet, Charging infrastructure consisting of charging units and new power supplies are required at Devolver. Bi-State issued an RFP in December of last year to facilitate the design and construction of the charging infrastructure, and two proposals were received in response, one from BP Pulse and one from Whistler Electric. Review of these proposals is underway, and a consensus meeting to discuss technical and cost scores is scheduled for next Tuesday, March 21st. The battery electric infrastructure being proposed will be funded by federal funds with matching funds from Prop M. So management is recommending that the operations committee approve and forward to the board of commissioners this request to authorize the president and CEO to enter into a contract with the highest ranking respondent to the battery electric bus infrastructure request for proposals. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Tom? Hearing none, hearing none are, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Thank you. And a second? Second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. 
contract award for the Paris Paratransit van purchase. Uh, again, Tom Curran. Thank you. Uh, management is requesting that the operations committee recommend authorizing an award of a five-year indefinite, deli indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity contract to central states bus sales for the purchase of paratransit vans. Last year, St. Clair County Transit District contacted Bi-State for assistance in procuring new vehicles for its alternative transportation system or ATS group due to difficulty in procuring light rail passenger vehicles in the current market. In September 2022, Bi-State issued a request for proposals for qualified manufacturers to produce and deliver these light passenger vehicles. The proposed contract is based on an anticipated minimum of 10 vehicles and a maximum of 50 vehicles over the next five years for St. Clair County Transit District. The solicitation maximum was 100 vehicles to provide Bi-State with an additional source for vehicle procurement for its own Colorado paratransit fleet and additional vehicles required by St. Clair County. Six vehicle manufacturers were solicited However, only one proposal was received from Central States Bus Sales. That proposal was forwarded to an evaluation team, including by state's quality assurance and vehicle maintenance departments, plus ATS's Director of Transportation. By state surveyed the firms that chose not to submit a proposal, and the responses received consistently stated that companies could not commit to a five-year procurement due to current market instability. St. Clair County Transit District has committed to 100% funding to purchase a minimum of 10 and a maximum of 50 vehicles. There's also an option for five of these vehicles to be battery electric. And by state's minimum purchase is zero vehicles up to a maximum of 50 vehicles. And funding is expected to be 80% FTA and 20% local match for those. Management is recommending that the Operations Committee approve a five-year indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity contract with Central States bus sales for the provision of paratransit vans and the not to exceed amount of $5,875,000. And again, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Questions for Tom? Tom, is this... Is this situation unusual? Um, a five year, you know, when you surveyed um, the bidders that, or the, those who chose not to bid, and they said a five year indefinite procurement process was, was too long that they couldn't commit to that. Is, is that. Does that give us pause? Do we need to have a shorter period of time? Or, I mean, because again, it's a single bidder. Right. In regard to production, I believe that the, the about a year ago, we approved a, a five-year contract that was similar for heavy-duty buses. So I think when you're talking about the production of a large number, or potentially, in this case, a large number of vehicles, that uh, five years is really kind of that rolling period of time that you need to acquire these vehicles, especially since we don't know how many vehicles St. Clair County will actually need. Uh, but the minimum again is 10 for them and a maximum of 50. So if the time frame was shorter, I don't know that you would be able to get, say, 50 vehicles for St. Clair County Transit District. Um, so that five year, I know that we've used it before. I'm not saying it could be shorter, uh, but we did the same thing for the heavy duty buses. Okay. The is stability of the market and the supply chain, I think, is related to vehicles in general. So I don't know that it's so much tied to the five years as it is the difficulties in just manufacturing at the moment. Okay. Is, is St. Clair, do they find these kinds of, um, did they find this proposal acceptable? I don't know if there's anyone that may, wants to make a comment on that. I'm not aware that. Yeah, I, I can, Tom. Um, yeah, it's St. So, uh, Chair, Chair Wynn Miller, uh, there is a big shortage of par paratransit vehicles all across the country. And it is true um, that this is new, that there's only a uh, same kind of more single bidder environment right, right now. Five years ago, that would not have been the case. It's much more competitive an environment. Uh, there's several different reasons for this, one of which is a lot of the paratransit vehicles 
and manufacturers are going through transitions into more electric uh, vehicle basis and also more efficient basis. Also, the supply chain shortage has really negatively affected the, the general market. This just gives us another option, and, and normally uh, St. Clair County would buy off of the standard IDOT contract, off the state purchase contract, um, to get their vehicles. But there was such a backlog associated with this, this gave, gives the district another, um, another option, along with by state another option. The, the, the truth of it is, if somebody has a paratransit vehicle that we can buy right now, we would buy it, okay? Um, we, our, our, uh, our fleet is very, very long in the tooth, so to speak. I have dozens of paratransit vehicles that exceed 600,000 miles. Our maintenance department should be commended that they're making it, um, but we are very f short on fleet purchases, and this is happening across the country when I was in DC, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this, this was a, a very hot, uh, high on the list of everybody's um, discussions. And one of the things that we've asked from our FTA partners is to give us more, uh, a higher spare ratio because everyone is looking for vehicles. So I apologize for the long um, uh, comment, but essentially this just gives us another option um, and Central States is a, is a uh, we have a lot of experience getting uh, paratransit vehicles from, from this supplier. They do a very good job. There's a lot of experience there. Thank you. I, I appreciate all that explanation. It, it's very helpful to me. Anyone else have any questions or comments? Seeing none, may have a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Did you get that second, Myra? Yes, I did. Thank you. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? Thank you. Item number eight is the contract award for St. Clair Yards and Shop Facility Cleaning. And again, Tom, Tom Curran. Yes, we are considering a contract award to MERS Goodwill to provide cleaning services for the St. Clair County of St. Clair Yards and Shop Facility. Last November, Bi-State issued a solicitation seeking proposals from qualified firms to provide cleaning equipment, supplies, and service for our Metrolink facility in Illinois. The RP was advertised on Bi-State's iSupplier website, and two proposals were received. Both proposals were deemed responsive and were awarded to an evaluation committee consisting of individuals from Metro's maintenance department. Based on technical and cost scores, MERS Goodwill was the highest ranked firm. Management is requesting that the operations committee approve this request for a five-year contract with MERS Goodwill for the provision of cleaning services for the St. Clair Yards and Shop Facility in the not to exceed amount of $682,000 $903.25. Any questions? Hearing none, may I have a motion to approve? More moves. Second. Second. Thank you. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Thanks, Tom, for uh, taking care of all those contractual pieces of the, the agenda. I think we are now um, going to ask John Langa for comments about on-call professional commercial real estate services. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, this agenda item is to consider hiring CBRE for on-call as needed real estate brokerage services. We have used such services in the past since 2012 for projects requiring specific knowledge of the real estate market. Last year, an RFP was issued and seven firms were invi invited to participate along with the general invitation on the I supplier. The seven firms included JLL, CBRE, Arbor Murphy, NII Desco, Lean Associates, Kyers International, and Cushman Wakefield. 
One proposal was submitted, that from CBRE, that was forwarded by a procurement to an evaluation team that determined the proposal meets the requirements and qualifications in the scope of work. CB is the largest real estate brokerage firm in the world. They have 200 people in their St. Louis office. They have public sector experience and experience with all types of buildings and locations we occupy. The on-call services in this would be commission-based. If we engage them to sell one of our properties, the commission would be 3% to CB for that overall transaction value. If that's a lease or sublease, that would be a 2.5%. And if we would ask them to go find a property for us and commissions not paid by the other side, uh, that commission would be 0.5% to CB. Otherwise, no bi-state funds are used. Management is requesting the operations committee recommend a three-year base contract with two option years. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. All great firms. And uh, CBRE, I've had experience with in the past, and uh, I concur with your uh, your statement. Yeah. Just just to ballpark it for me, John. In the past, um, how much do we usually engage We've, our firms? And, and it, uh, commissioner, it's been a mix. Uh, for instance, we sold the wetland property south of our Brentwood bus garage. We did not use a broker for that. We were able to get that out in the market. It was a very straightforward project. Uh, at the same time, we did we did the same thing for where the developer bought the DeBoliver parking lot. We were able to get that out in the market and move forward on that. At the same time though, for instance, Hangar 12 at the airport, we needed specific help getting that out to a, a, a larger community and then expertise in showing that, negotiating that back and forth. So it's it's a mix and we, we don't just assume that, hey, let's go use a broker. I mean, we really, uh, what what is the purpose? Where does this get us type of thing? I appreciate that. And I appreciate the work that you and your team are doing um, to do some of that in-house and to know when, when you need to hire someone who has expertise in a particular sector. So are there any, any other questions? I have a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Thank you. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, Talby, are, is there any unscheduled business? I have no unscheduled business this morning. Well, then I will ask uh, Mr. Stewart for an operations report. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Lynn Miller. Good morning, everyone. Can everybody hear me? Yep. No problem yes. last time. Okay. <laughs> All right. So you have in your packets uh, our uh, ridership trends, our performance summaries, our workforce update. I want to um, highlight some of the items there, and then I want to go into further detail about the changes that we are about to make uh, to our call -a ride system. So our ridership is generally up, uh, but you had to take that into consideration as to where we're coming from. Um, in fiscal year 19, for example, we had over 36 um, million boardings, uh, whereas in 21, we had 17 million and 22, we had 18 million. Uh, so what we're showing here for the current year, year to date, we're showing a 6.9% increase uh, for bus, 8.6 for Metrolink, and of course, call a ride is down by 9%, but I'll talk more about that um, later. But again, it's relative to where we were in, in 22 versus, let's say, 19. Uh, workforce, we are still uh, in need of uh, bus drivers. We're 204 bus drivers short as of January. 18 uh, Metrolink uh, operators and 79 caller riders, caller ride operators, which again, I will talk more about when I drill down further on caller ride. We're also down 58 mechanics and electricians. As a result of these conditions, um, we've had to make service changes. We've made a service change in, in November. We just made a service change um, 
the other day, March 13th. Again, these service changes are about matching up the resources that we have with our ability to provide service. So um, actually things are improving as it relates to that. In November, we had missed trips of about 6.1%. In November, they were down to 2.5%. In January, they were down to 1.8%. So it's working. We're matching up, we're getting better at those things. Um, our numbers are improving in terms of the ability to recruit and retain uh, new operators, new employees. Uh, we have started a mentorship program that we are very, very excited about. It's in partnership with the ATU union. We have 19 operators that have volunteered to be mentors as new uh, operators of all types come out of training. They will be paired up with mentors uh, in order to help us to retain uh, these employees after they finish training. We're very excited. Uh, amongst these 19 um, volunteers, we have two of our most seasoned operators, uh, one with 47 years, uh, Mr. Orvin Wooten, and one with 49 years, uh, Mr. Bruce Williams. So it's encouraging that our senior operators are willing to assist us in improving our ability to attract, maintain, and properly train and develop new operators. So we're very excited about that. So I want to stop there in case there are any questions about uh, operations and workforce uh, before I dive deeper into college. Questions for Chuck? Okay. No question, but mm -hmm. I'll just add, I know Arvin and uh, <laughs> an Illinois man you got over there. So Absolutely. he's like normally Absolutely. an Illinois man if he's not anymore, but he's a great guy. He's been driving he, he, forever. <laughs> he has. These are our gentlemen drivers, our right. operators. They are throwback to when a bus operator was a profession. Okay. That's right. You take That's pride right. in what they do. They That's look right. it, they walk it, they talk it. So I'm very, um, I'm very pleased to have them volunteer to help us with this situation. That's great. That's real good. So, so let's jump into cholera. We're about to go through a very painful experience with cholera. It is something that we are, we have to do. We're compelled to do it. Um, you have to understand that. Colorado is an ADA complementary paratransit service. It is to, supposed to coincide with our fixed route transit service. It is designed to operate within three quarter miles of Metrolink and Metro bus to provide that safety net for people that have disabilities that prevent them from riding the bus or Metrolink. It's not intended to meet all transportation needs of people with disabilities all the time. Again, it is a safety net. We have allowed over the years Colorado to go outside of those parameters. We have let it grow. At a, at, there was a time we had plenty of Colorado operators. We had plenty of vans. Uh, we could provide the service. We could be provide plus service. Now we need to focus on providing basic service. So on April 10th, we're going to reconfigure the Colorado area to conform with the federal requirement of the three quarter miles within the fixed route service. Okay, it's going to cause a lot of issues for a lot of people. But what we're experiencing right now in January, for example, we had 40 um, 7,000 uh, requests for Colorado service. We had to deny 17,000 requests because we're not working within our, our manpower constraints and the federal requirements. So we're moving uh, on April 10th uh, to move back into that, um, that, par that polygon of Colorado service and we will be, we've taken extensive efforts 
over the last few months to to make it known exactly what we're doing. We've had public meetings. We've done emails. We've done postcards. We we posted things on our on our website. Uh, we've done everything we can to prepare the public for this change. What it's going to result in is better service to our paratransit riders. It's going to, to decrease the, the call volumes. It's going to decrease the denials, just like we've done uh, with bus and Metrolink service, bringing down the missed trips numbers through transforming uh, or moving back into the service that we can can adequately provide. So that's what's about to take place on April 10th. We had a public meeting on March 7th. There were approximately 30 people in attendance. Uh, we reviewed our plan with the, with these um, customers, Colorado customers. Um, we offered them alternatives if they were going to be impacted by the service. Everybody's not going to be impacted, but those that are, we are trying to provide alternative services for them. Uh, we are considering things like expanding our footprint for VIA in order to pick up on some of the service areas that we've lost. So it's been a very, um, it's, it's a very um, painful experience. It's going to impact a lot of people. We're doing our, our best to provide alternatives to those individuals, and um, it's a necessity. We have to do this. We have to, it's just like putting out bus service and the bus doesn't show up. We're trying to cut back on, on those occurrences. We're going to do the same thing with Colorado. We're gonna bring it back into the boundaries. And with that, we think we can provide a much better service. Got a lot more, uh, but I'll open it to questions and maybe we'll hit some of the other highlights through the question and answer process. So I'll pause now for questions. Chairwoman, I have a question, if I may. Uh, Mr. Stewart, you know, I know there's a lot of agony associated with what yes. you're trying to accomplish for yes. you. And we're going to see, as it has already started, uh, you know, probably a, a high onslaught of media response. What are you able to do? What collectively are we able to do to try to mitigate against those negative impacts? If some of you may have seen the woman already that was in tears about the loss and how she get to work, and she clearly has a complete dependency. But that, again, that's just the first I'm sure of many. Is there anything we can do or anything planned to try to mitigate against the heavy impact that media might throw at us? Well, um, I'm I'm more concerned about our customers than the media. Well, uh, what, we, no, we, we have, have been, media, yeah. media using our customers. I'm speaking specifically Absolutely. to the customer, but uh, the, the media is the vehicle that the customers will use because that's in some cases the only one they have. And, and I think you're absolutely right. We're going to have more of that. Um, I made my debut on Channel 2 last week. Um, Elliot won't leave you alone for a while. Well, wasn't Elliot yet, but I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure that's, I'm sure that's coming. coming. But, um, you know, it, it, it's a tough situation. We've, you know, we've, we are reaching out uh, to the impacted customers. We've uh, we sent out six thousand postcards. We've we've had had nine hundred individual conversations uh, with people that are being impacted, and for the most part, we are finding solutions uh, for these individuals. So that's the word that we have to keep putting out: that we are finding solutions. We're not net, we're not leaving people high and dry. We're trying to find some way to help them in their situation. Uh, but also we need the support of the community. This is not just a bi-state issue. This is a regional issue. There are other organizations that are formed to provide support services uh, to the dis disabled community. We need to work in collaboration with them in order to find solutions in those areas where we don't have a ready solution at this point. 
Thank you. Other questions for, for Chuck? Chuck, I think I had a follow-up to your last comment, which is, are, are you working with Paraquad and with some of the other organizations that are um, that provide support and services to, to the disabled? We, we are, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Commissioner, I didn't mean to jump it's in. It's okay. Um, we are certainly, we've heard from them all. We've heard from them. Um, we are responding to their um, questions, comments, observations about the situation. We are begging them to work with us in this um, so that together we can um, provide solutions uh, where nothing is apparent at this time. So yes, we are. So may I make a suggestion, um, Talby, and perhaps you're already doing this. I don't normally make suggestions about um, how to use for operational purposes because that's that's not that's not our our, our job is really not its governance and policy. But um, I would strongly suggest that you set up some kind of a working group with organizations that are working with. Um, communities that are having difficulty accessing traditional transit and keep a working group together during this process. I, I appreciate that we've had public meetings and that we've, we, you've engaged in personal conversations, but really this needs to be an ongoing, um, attention needs to be paid ongoing to this. And, and I think that in order for us to get in front of this, we need to take the lead on it. So I would strongly suggest that something like that happen um, and that there be resources and staff time devoted to it, so. Uh, Commissioner, I think that is exactly the direction that we're headed in. We need help. We cannot be the, the solution for the entire need of the, of the region. So I think it is an incumbent upon us to take a leadership role in facilitating other uh, organizations in assisting with this problem. Thank you, and thank situation. you to you and your staff for working on this. I know it's a very difficult, challenging issue. Mm -hmm. Very much. And I would like to... Go ahead, sir. Thank you. So, so thank you, Rose, for that great suggestion. Is very good, um, and and we'll be sure to. Because I just want to reiterate um, these decisions, these very tough management decisions are based on essentially the metric that we've all been looking at over the several months, that 18,000 denied boardings. This, this is trying to make hard decisions associated with a very difficult management of the system so that we are disappointing as few people as possible. Um, and. And however, uh, I will please let me assure everyone that Chuck and his team and in these, um, this staff cares about these individuals who are impacted. Um, and they approach all of those meetings in that way. Um, and I think Chuck has done a very, a very good, good job within the tough metric of being in front of the media and talking about this uh, honestly and squaring our shoulders and confronting a difficulty. What would be a problem is if we didn't confront, confront those 18,000 denials. We, we, the numbers are telling us that we need to make a movement. So we need to make that movement and try to disappoint as few piece, people as possible. I think this working group uh, during this is a great way to try to lean into these partners and see how we can provide us uh, resources as best we can. So I'll be happy to support Chuck and his team in trying to develop that a little further. Thank you so much for the suggestion. And, and, and I saw, thank you, Talby, and I saw Commissioner Moore's hand up. And you're on mute. One more thing. I, I recall, and, and maybe I'm inaccurate, help me because I, I have, uh, this, is, this is memory and maybe it's flawed, but there, was many years ago a problem with bus service into West County, as I remember, and businesses came forward to try to assist in mitigating against that problem. 
-hmm. So maybe some consideration could be given to businesses that are impacted and would want to participate um, in developing a remedy or being part of a process that results in a remedy. I think that's an excellent suggestion. Uh, we have talked to businesses that are that hire, for the most part, disabled individuals, uh, mm -hmm. people with disabilities, and uh, they are they are trying to be a part of the solution. Right. So, so I think we've got right. some really, and and I think the the important thing to take away from this is this is just the beginning. As as Commissioner Windmiller suggested, this is an ongoing thing. This is us just the start. We have to stay with this until we help the community to work it out. So yes, we're committed to doing that. Thank you. Okay. Um, if there's no more on that, I'd like to, a couple of other things, just want to update you on the ATU uh, union contract. Uh, it went to vote a few weeks ago. We made a proposal. They voted it down. Um, but I th uh, we're, 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 we're going to be okay. Um, I think we need to uh, enhance our ability to communicate what we are offering to our front line. And I think with that, that we will garner additional support as we move forward. Negotiations will resume on April 17th. And I'm hoping that um, in a short time after that, that we will uh, reach some type of uh, solution. It is not, um, it is not um, unordinary that uh, it goes to vote several times before it's passed. And uh, even, even the IBW contract went to vote several times before it got passed. So we're not, we're not necessarily defeated by that. We are, um, we are regenerating our, our energy and ready to jump back in and move forward. And again, that will start on April 17th. And last but not least, I would like to, I think you've already heard that uh, Darren Curry, our assistant executive, uh, Director of, of Transit Assets has announced his retirement. Uh, we're in the process of, of determining where we go next. I don't think we can replace Darren. He's been a he's been a fixture here, and he has been very instrumental uh, in the success of our transit assets area. Uh, but I think it is time for us to to look at. Uh, what we want to be five years, 10 years, 15 years from now, uh, and plan accordingly uh, with this opportunity. So we're wishing Darren all the best, and he'll be here with us until July to help us through this situation. So just wanted to make you aware of that. And that concludes my report. Uh, any other questions, I'd be happy to answer. I do. Oh, thank you, uh, thank you, Commissioner uh, Chuck. So the, you mentioned that the um, the uh, the we saw a growth rate of over nineteen percent in ridership on the system. Um, um, I don't think I said nineteen. I, you, you're you're back on mute. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry. Maybe I got that from looking at the report. So the so report the, is the, I gave the year to date numbers. You gave the quarter, that's the third quarter number, quarter three numbers that you're looking at. Uh, but again, uh, that's compared to last year, um, which was uh, 18 million boardings in fiscal year 22. So yes, okay. we're, we're, we are experiencing um, increases uh, in ridership, uh, primarily in Metrolink. Uh, a lot of it has to do with activities opening back up, athletic activities, those kind of things. So um, yes. Okay. Well, so so my my basic question is, and you may have you may have shared this, I apologize if I missed it, is what where are we at in terms of um, I guess our ridership compared to pre-pandemic? Oh um, we're, we're, yeah. Yeah, that's that's really the question that I've got, and, and you know, because if we're looking at a percentage increase from the lows, then that may not be as 
as, as, as useful for me, just in terms of understanding where we're at and, and how we are actually reba rebounding on the system. So what those comparisons are, are comparisons to the lows, okay? If you go back to fiscal year 19, for example, we had 36.6 million boardings. In 20, we had 30.3 million. In 21, we had 17.4. So that's the low, okay? That's the low, uh, fiscal year 21. 22, we started seeing increases. We went from 17.4 to 18.5. So the numbers I'm giving you now or in comparison to fiscal year 22, which again was a low year. So if you need me to prepare something that, and I've, I'm, actually I've already asked for it, something that helps you to gauge that, that prime period versus and the lows and then how we're recovering from that, I'd be glad to do that. Yeah, thanks. I think that was really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. The only the only other thing I wanted to add is, while I appreciate that you know boardings in right before the pandemic in fiscal year nineteen were at thirty six million, that was still a um, passenger drop from our our high, yes. which I believe was around forty million. I think you're right, absolutely. So. Um, obviously, the pandemic and, and other things since 2019 have been have had an impact, but ridership was dropping prior to that. So that's something that um, needs to be factored into our conversations. Yeah. Thanks so much. Any other Probably questions? Have one question. Yeah, I I just wanted to add. I contemplated not mentioning it, but but adding an exclamation point to what Rose said earlier about the working group and why I think that's such a great idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, I understand the position the agency is in with call ride and, and we have limited assets, limited resources and a big mission. I also think this discussion of the 18,000, you know, trips that were declined, while it is good for us to maybe scale back and, and, and give more reliable service, let's not forget that when we do that, and this is thinking more regionally, those 18,000 trips declined won't be on our books, but there will still be, you know, 18,000 people that need service that aren't getting them. So while that aren't getting it. So while our numbers will get better and we will have more reliable service, probably to the people that we're accepting trips to, um, it's still a regional problem. And, you know, this agency, just as we saw with the loop trolley and other areas, when there is a, a transportation issue that needs to be solved, whether we're using our assets or not, we are generally going to be at the center and helping to facilitate that conversation just because we know how to do it. So I, I wanted to really put an exc exclamation point on what Rose said um, and, and make it a mission of this agency not to leave those 18,000 requests behind, even if they're not, they're not being fulfilled by a by state Colorado, some other means. But I think we should be, you know, at the center of helping to move that conversation and letting those people know they're not left behind. So great point, Rose. And I just wanted to, to put that that point of emphasis on it, too. Agreed. So thanks very much, Chuck. Any other questions or comments? Great. Um, thank you. I think, thank you. The, the next item on our agenda is the president's report. Talby, do you have anything for us? I do. Good morning. So uh, just very quickly, um, I'm a, a little bit behind this week on, and thank you, Chuck, for that very thorough report. Great job, by the way. Um, but I was in D.C. all this week, and I'm very happy to say that a very, very productive week in D.C., uh, meeting with both the House and Senate, uh, sometimes the staff, as the House was out of session, but uh, did meet directly with several of our senators, very productive meetings. Um, also, uh, on Monday, we gave a technical, or I gave a technical presentation uh, to FTA on uh, north side, south side, and the Jefferson alignment specifically, and a early primer on, uh, on the North County Metrolink uh, options that, the, that St. Louis County is looking at. 
That was very, very well received. Um, we had an excellent discussion on the technical merits of that project. Um, and we are moving forward, as many of you may know, we did put a, a primary management consultant contract out on the street. Um, and uh, I was very popular at the, in DC with the engineering firms who are interested in bidding on that project. We, we have uh, preliminarily seen a lot of the firms that we would love to partner with on that project. So a lot of good momentum there and a lot of very, very high interest from our federal partners at FTA. Additionally, I ha I'm moving forward after those meetings with um, specifically Congresswoman Bush and, and Senator Tammy Duckworth. Um, we are asking for a directed appropriation um, and that was due actually today. Uh, we finished that um, with help of staff and we are asking for a director to appropriation based on our Chestnut Health mental health professionals on uh, Metrolink, a very, very uh, successful program. As a matter of fact, it's been featured and I, I will send this to the commissioners in Mass Transit Magazine. And I got a lot of attention about that program, um, how it's working um, with our colleagues. I had a discussion with it from a colleague at uh, MBTA in Boston and actually with um, the new CEO at MARTA as well on the success of that program. So a very interesting, innovative program, essentially a springboard program from one that was started uh, very ambitiously by St. Clair County Transit District, uh, you know, that innovation from our partners is always appreciated. And now we're taking that baton and running with it. Uh, so that is in. I also talked very specifically with FTA about our emergency relief funding. That's having to do with the emergency relief funding from, um, from our past July. You may remember the flooding that, that impacted. As a matter of fact, we lost an LRV on. Uh, the federal government is stepping up and uh, specifically Congresswoman Bush's office was instrumental along with uh, the senators um, moving nearly $200 million of funding for the country, but a specific mark for us of roughly $20 million to help us pay for that. Um, and we're expecting that process to be uh, sent to us in the next couple of weeks as far as the applications are concerned and we'll be able to pull our FEMA applications. But very, very good news. These are the kind of partnerships with both our state, federal uh, partners and our legislative uh, teams that we are talking, communicating regularly because then that's the way that they can come through for us legislatively. Essentially funding and interest is the lifeblood of a healthy transit system. I also just want to comment just very quickly about uh, the ridership, if, if I may. So we, are, we would love to uh, return to 100% of that pre-pandemic ridership. And I just want to comment on this because it was a subject of our discussions with a lot of my colleagues. Essentially, we need to remember that the economy has changed underneath our feet the same movements that we saw in 2017 as, as to, for instance, a very downtown centric job center, et cetera, work patterns of five days a week. Uh, commissioners, that world has left us, okay? So what we need to do is make an adjustment and build a system that is responsive to this new dynamic of economics and movement. And so that means that it'll be more difficult for us, but more of a diffusion of our economic system, working on more of a grid-based transit system as opposed to a hub and spoke so that it is more responsive and we are putting a lot of our investments in, in our uh, primary uh, pieces of movement uh, like Metrolink, like some of our larger bus lines inherently because they are more efficient from a labor standpoint and they move more people um, for the least amount of overall investment. Um, so like a lot of our colleagues across the country, this challenge of figuring out not only, so we're not gonna regain all of those riders of pre-pandemic era, I would say maybe we'll get 80% of them, but the next 20% those are new riders. So we need to look at how do we attract them. We attract them by having better curb appeal, making investments in safety and security, trying to get people onto our systems that are new to our systems. 
And so we should be looking at all of those aspects, in, in including fundamental programs like the Chestnut Health System, like SPP, being sure that the curb appeal of, of our system is at its highest level so that we can get back to the ridership that we once enjoyed. So it's certainly a challenge. We're trying to get back every single percentage, but thinking of how we change, because 2017 is now, it might as well be, I'm sorry, 1965. The world has changed underneath our feet, and now we need to be aggressive enough to change as a transit system. So uh, just a very quick comment, and thank you for allowing me the time. Thanks, Toby, and I appreciate that because it, it, it certainly is important to our conversation that the world has changed substantially and so has transit and people's moving patterns. Uh, any other comments or questions? Hearing none, um, Myra, will you give us the dates for upcoming board and committee meetings? Yes, the next board of commissioners meeting will be held on Friday, April 21st. The next safety and security committee meeting will be held on Thursday, April 27th. The next operations committee will be held on Thursday, May 25th, as well as the audit finance administration committee meeting. All of the meetings will begin at 8.30 a.m. Thanks so much. Um, before we adjourn, I just wanted to, to say, um, I neglect to say this sometimes, and um, I wish I didn't. First of all, thanks to the, uh, all of you, the, the, the board members who are on this committee and the ones who aren't and still faithfully show up. But also, I wanted to thank our interpreters. Um, they do such a wonderful job for every single meeting. And um, I, I watch you, um, and, and I, I just really appreciate that you are bringing this service to so many people who are perhaps hearing impaired. Thank you. Um, hearing no other, if there's no other um, uh, agenda items for us, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. We're ready to begin the audit finance committee. Commissioner Beach, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll call the AFA committee meeting to order. Uh, Meyer, will you please call roll? Commissioner Beach. Present. Commissioner Simmons. Commissioner Pistello. Commissioner Johnson. Here. Commissioner Gladney. Commissioner Moore. Present. Commissioner Windmiller. Present. Commissioner Cox. Commissioner Galladay. Here. Commissioner Brown. Here. You can proceed. Thank you. Myra, were there any uh, comment cards, speaker cards received for this meeting? There were no speaker cards submitted for today's meeting. Thank you. The next order of business is the approval of the minutes from the January 27th AFA committee meeting. You all were provided uh, the minutes for review. Is there a motion to approve? Unless there are any comments? More approved, mo motion to approve. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Uh, moving along with the agenda items, uh, items five six and seven items five item five is the fiscal 23 external audit plan item six financial statements item seven treasurer's report i lump them together because tammy fulbright will handle all three these items are for information only tammy thank you good morning commissioners um, i'll start with the 2023 external audit plan this item is for informational purposes our auditors ruben brown are in their fifth year of a five-year contract They'll be on site in August and we'll have draft financial statements in, in October for the October committee meeting and November board meeting for approval. Their services will continue to include the audit report and assistance with the ACFR, the single audit of federal awards, 
the NTD agreed upon procedures, independent auditors report on Illinois grant accountability and transparency report, and finally, the preparation of the 990 for arts and transit. And I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any on this item. And if not, um, for the financials at December 31st, I'll briefly go through um, our enterprises. So for Gateway Arch, year-to-date income was 1.2 million. Ridership was up 38% from the prior year. Revenue is 820,000 uh, more than the budget and expenses are, are under budget by about 332,000, primarily due to staffing shortages. For the riverfront uh, attractions, year-to-date income before depreciation was 874,000. This was 414,000 more than budget, mainly also due to staffing uh, shortages. For the airport, we saw a small year-to-date loss of 33,000, and for Freightway, a small year-to-date loss of 39,000. For transit, year-to-date income was 163.1 million. This is 158 more than budget and is largely due to an increased draw of COVID relief funds of 139.8 million offset by a decline in sales tax of 2.3 million. So we're bringing in COVID relief funds to take advantage of improved interest rates. Interest revenue is up 2.9 million and we've received 1.5 million in private funding for SPP to date. Um, expenses are down 15.8 million uh, due to operator shor shortages and also uh, reduced services. And that's the update for um, our financial statements at 1231. For cash and investments, um, by state directed funds were 442 million uh, with an average rate of return of 3.8%. And our by state trustee directed funds were at 48.8 million, also with an average rate of return of 3.8 million. And I just would qu quickly like to note um, that this reporting that we prepare for the board is um, maintained in an Excel spreadsheet. So. We know sometimes that um, we have some issues in reporting. And so we're looking, um, I'm actually kind of restructuring our team to kind of help review that and better support um, that reporting. And we also are looking at possibly a treasury workstation that can help um, actually automate and eliminate some of these reporting areas that we might have also. Um, in addition, I wanna just mention that the fuel hedge through December 31st realized gains are 5.2 million. We, recite, we really wanted to just right size uh, the number of contracts to align with our actual needs. And so that's what we're, why we're seeing such a, a huge realized gain. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Any questions for Tammy? Thank you so much. Next item, item Eight, Treasury Safekeeping Quarterly Accounts Audit ending December 31st, 2022, Crystal Mesner. Good morning, Commissioners. The Internal Audit Department uh, reviewed the Treasury Safekeeping Accounts for December 31st, 2022 that Ms. Fulbright just presented. Uh, we did determine that the safekeeping accounts exist and the respective balances and credit ratings reported in that Treasurer's report are fairly presented. A series of schedules that support the findings was included in the attached tables. I'm available for any questions as this is just informational only. Any questions for Crystal? Thank you. Moving right along. Item agenda nine, procurement report, uh, Tom Curran. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm presenting for the committee's information a preliminary procurement activity report for the third quarter of 2023. Since our fiscal year's third quarter will not end until March 31st, a complete data set will not be available until the May AFA committee meeting. The first page of the report with the colored bar chart is the non-competitive procurement trend. So far during the third quarter of fiscal year 2023, non-competitive procurements totaled $1.2 million or 10.3% of the total purchase order commitment volume of $11.9 million. Total spending in the first two months of the third quarter has been dramatically less than any quarter so far in the past year. Over the past 12 months, non-competitive procurements totaled $39.8 million, or about 26% of the total purchase order volume of $154 million. Because of the high level of non-competitive spending in the first two quarters of this fiscal year, it will still take some time for the rolling 12-month indicator to get back to its usual level. The second page of the report displays preliminary procurement card activity for the third quarter of fiscal year 23. 
there have been 3,548 transactions made using procurement cards with a total value of $1 million. The average cost for procurement purchases so far this year using cards, $287. The third page shows preliminary contract awards over $100,000 for the third quarter of fiscal year 23. The largest of these contracts was with Standard Insurance Company for employee life and disability insurance. And then the final page lists preliminary contract modifications for the third quarter. The largest of these contracts included the exercise of option years on existing contracts for life and disability insurance and for rail testing. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions for Tom? Thank you. Thank you. Item 10, the 2021 401- 1K audit update, Dave Tobin, as well as item 11, he will address pension plans, 401k retirement savings program, and other post-employment benefit trust investment performance update as of December 31st of last year. Dave. Good morning, commissioners, and thank you. As mentioned, I'm presenting on two informational items under tabs 10 and 11 in your packet. Again, these are both informational only items. The first item under tab 10 is an update on our annual 401k plan audit. This audit was done for plan year 2022, which ended December 31st, 2022. I'm happy to report that our audit firm, UHY LLP, has issued a qualified opinion, which means they have found no deficiencies within the management and handling of our 401k plan. While total assets were actually down, this is largely due to market conditions, Cash inflows representing employer and employee contributions remain relatively stable. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions for Dave? Okay. Mr. Roach, any unscheduled business? Um, I, if I could do um, item yeah. one real quick. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Okay, so the second item under tab 11 is a performance update as of December 31st, 2022 for our three defined benefit pension plans, our defined contribution 401k plan, and our other post-employment benefit program known as OPEB Trust. The 401k plan ended 2022 with 72.4 million in assets, which is actually down 15.1 million from 2021, clearly largely due to market conditions. Both employee and employer contributions remained relatively stable as were investment elections. There were no investment fund manager changes recommended in the fourth quarter. For the three pension plans, the salary plan ended 2022 with total assets of 89.4 million. And while the portfolio lost 13.4% in 2022, the fourth quarter saw a 6.1% gain. And since inception, the total portfolio earned 7.2% on an actuarial return rate of 6%, so it is actually beating its um, actuarial target rate. The IBW plan ended 2022 with total assets of 6.6 .6 million. This is a relatively small plan. There aren't a, not a large number of members in it. Um, while the portfolio lost 15.4% in 2022, the fourth quarter saw a 6.1% gain. And since inception, the total portfolio returned 6.2% on an actuarial return target of 6%. This closed plan continues with an ongoing rebalancing plan that reduces risk, thereby reducing investment returns, but actually preserving principal assets over time. The ATU plan ended 2022 with total assets of 154.1 million. While the portfolio lost 15.3% in 2022, the fourth quarter saw a 7.8% gain and over the prevailing 10-year period, this portfolio has gained 7.3% overall. The portfolio's re actuarial return target is 6.5%. The Bi-State OPEB Trust Retirement, uh, excuse me, Retirement Trust ended 2022 with total assets of 53.8 million. While this portfolio lost 10.6% in 2022, the fourth quarter saw a 7.1% gain and since inception has returned 5.3% on an actuarial return target of 6%. While the returns have trailed the target slightly, this portfolio was only established in 2024. 
Prior to that, the trust um, assets were mainly in money market funds, basically earning next to no return at all. That ends my informational report on this item, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Sorry I got ahead of myself. I had St. Patrick's Day on my mind. No worries. <laughs> any questions for Dave on, on that issue? Now, Paul, be any unscheduled business? Commissioner, I have no unscheduled business, and I gave my report in operations, so we're good to go. Mara, upcoming dates again, please. Um, as noticed, noted previously, the next Board of Commissioners meeting will be held on Friday, April 21st. The next Safety and Security Committee meeting will be held on Thursday, April 27th. And the next Operations Committee and Audit Finance Administration Committee meetings will be held on Thursday, May 25th, all meetings beginning at 8.30 a.m. Thank you. We do have an executive session need today. Uh, I need a motion that this committee go into executive session for the purpose of discussing legal, confidential, or privileged matters as permitted under Bi-State Development Board Policy Chapter 10, Section 10.080D1, Legal, and D10, Auditors. Is there such a motion? So moved. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Galladay. Yes. Commissioner Brown. Yes. Commissioner Moore. Yes. Commissioner Beach. Yes. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. The motion passed. 